Mark German, Director of Education Strategies and Initiatives. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon as we mark the 12th anniversary of our festival. I'd like to thank our extraordinary generous sponsors and those governors who make the festival possible, including our founding benefactors, the Simons Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the John Templeton Foundation. And this year's major supporters, Con Edison, the Cobley Prize, and Ziff, the Bezos Family Foundation, the Della Pietra Family Foundation, and New York University. We're deeply grateful to NYU, and particularly to President Andrew Hamilton, Lynn Brown, Stacey Grisman Bloom, Catherine Fleming, and the terrific team here at the NYU Center for Genomics and Systems Biology for helping to make today's event possible in this wonderful space. Our moderator this afternoon is Kenya Murray. Kenya is an epidemiologist with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She has her bachelor's in science from Mississippi State University and her master's of public health from the University of Georgia. Kenya has worked in public health for the Center for Disease Control in Zambia, Atlanta, Georgia, and New York City. She is a member of the organization 500 Women Scientists. Kenya? Um, so today is a really amazing opportunity for you young women. Um, I also see a few young men in the audience, so I want to be inclusive in my language. So pardon me if I, I say women and not include the men. So thank you guys for coming here to support us. Um, you'll have the opportunity to meet a number of scientists from the amazing New York University. And the World Science Festival has arranged for you to tour the labs run by women scientists. And we have some amazing women scientists here with us today. And so these women are changing the world with their knowledge, their expertise, and just engaging and empowering women to imagine a new possibility. And so it's a great way for you to see women in leadership roles, but to also meet some of their students to imagine what your career would look like as a scientist or a budding scientist. And so um, I gave you guys a brief introduction um, earlier, but I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. So my name is Kenya Murray. Um, I am the last born of 11 children. Ooh. I think I have the most number of siblings in the room. <laughs> um, I'm also from the great state of Mississippi. And you're from Mississippi too? <laughs> okay, we had a few hands raised um, back there. And so I want to tell you how I chose my career as an infectious disease epidemiologist. And so growing up as one of 11 children, one can imagine that my family didn't have a lot of money. And so none of my siblings went to college. I was the first to go to college one and two times, and I planned to go back for my doctoral degree. And so when it came to choosing my career as an infectious disease epidemiologist, I knew I loved science, but I didn't know what type of science I loved. And so while um, in movie time in the sixth grade, we were watching a movie called Outbreak um, with Dustin Hoffman. How many people have seen that movie? Excellent. I, I wasn't sure what the audience response was going to be. So I was watching that movie and I was like, I want to do that for a living. Um, but I didn't have the language to even know what he was doing in the movie. Um, also, I think to give you a little bit more about the underrepresentation of women in science, at that time in my classroom there were no female scientists. So I didn't see that in my reality. Also, there were women who didn't look like me. Um, there were not women of color who served in those roles. So I couldn't conceptualize the possibility of being a scientist. Um, but with the encouragement of my peers, um, people around me, my community, and also my parents, um, I moved forward in that possibility. And not only was I able to create that possibility of becoming an epidemiologist, but I no longer have to depend on Dustin Hoffman for that reality. I, I often tell people that I star in my own movie. And so today you'll get to star in your own movie. You'll get to hear from two amazing women scientists who are changing the world with their research, but they're also creating a level of possibility for what empowerment and inclusivity looks like within this community. Um, I also want to give a plug for an organization that got me here to host this um, event with you all called 500 Women Scientists. And so 500 Women Scientists was an organization started by four women in 2016. And so they had the belief that women should be included in science and that we should be included in an equitable way. And so they decided, amongst the four of them, that they would create an organization. Since 2016, how big do you think that organization has gotten? Is anybody 
anybody have a guess? Thousands. Thousands. There are over 20,000 members and women who represent this organization from over 120 countries. And I think that is symbolic of the ability of women to change the world. And it doesn't always take a crowd, just four women with a belief. And so I hope that you guys could meet some new people here today, um, but also create your new possibility by sitting next to someone, asking questions, but also learning what their interests are as well. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so before we um, break up into our lab tours, we have two guest speakers. Um, the first is a neuroscientist, Wendy Suzuki. Professor Suzuki studies brain plasticity at NYU's Center for Neural Science. She is known for her extensive work and impact of exercise on the brain and how we form and retain long-term memory. Professor Suzuki went to the University of California, Berkeley for her undergraduate degree, UC San Diego for her PhD, and did her postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. Professor Suzuki does a lot of things. I, I hope I could do half of what you do. She teaches, she conducts research, she writes, and has taught intensity. Intensati. Intensati. Yes. Which is a workout that combines everything from cardio exercises to yoga to spoken meditation. She wrote the popular book, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, that was recently made into a PBS science special. Her newest book, Good Anxiety, Bad Anxiety, will be published this September. Her TED Talk was one of the top five most popular TED Talks in 2018. And so I'd like to welcome Professor Suzuki. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here to help welcome you and then welcome you into my lab after we finish these introductions. And I want to just continue on this wonderful uh, introduction that we had uh, by telling you why I wanted to become a neuroscientist. And that was because of one day. That day was the very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley, and I had signed up for a class. It was a freshman seminar class, so it's a small class, just 15 students, and a full professor talking about their expertise. And this class was called The Brain and Its Potential. And my professor, who I didn't know, I, it was my first day of, of school, um, her name was Marion Diamond. But I'll never forget that very first day. She was standing at the front of the classroom, and she said, I'm so glad you're here, as I am, that you are here. Because it means that you care about your brain. Did you realize that the brain is the most complex structure known to humankind? The most complex, okay? Better than anything that NASA is working on, better than anything that the most complex company is working on. It is more complex, and we all have one right here. This is the structure that allowed us to discover radioactivity, to discover the breast cancer gene, and to discover the structure of DNA. These three things, by the way, discovered by female brains. Can I have a, have a breath? <laughs> so as she was reminding us about, or telling us about how amazing the brain was, she slipped on her gloves and she opened a hat box that was on the table in front of her, very much like this one. And what do you think she pulled out of that hat box? A real human brain. That's why I ask people to sit in the front row. So this is a real adult human brain. Go ahead, take your pictures out, take your cameras out. This is the most photographed brain in the country. Her name is Betty, if you're wondering. Tag, please tag Betty. Um, so this is the front of the brain, frontal lobe. My eyes, if this was in my head, my eyes would be sitting right here. Prefrontal cortex, critical for decision making, keeping things in mind um, for um, uh, focus and attention. And then I'll jump back 
to the back of the brain right here, right at the back of our heads. This is primary visual cortex. This allows us to see. Did you realize that if you have your eyes completely intact but you have damage to these two areas right here, you are effectively blind. You see both with your eyes and with your brain. And finally, uh, uh, turning over, you see these two lobes at the bottom of the brain. This is the temporal lobe, and it houses my favorite structure of the brain. It's called the hippocampus. Can I have you say that? Hippocampus. I want you, thank you, I want you to remember that because the hippocampus is critical for our ability to form and retain new long-term memories. What is the name of that structure? The hippocampus. Thank you. There's one here and one here. So you can imagine us freshmen, the 15 of us, we were in awe. We'd never seen a human brain before. We got to hold it. We got to uh, explore it. But that alone was not what, what made me want to become a neuroscientist. What made me want to become a neuroscientist was the studies that Professor Diamond told me about after she showed us the brain. And these were her fundamental studies that she did in the 1960s at UC Berkeley. Um, these were studies on adult rat brains, and they were asking the simple question, can the adult rat brain change at all? Or, once we get to adulthood, all the parents in the room, that's it. Sorry, no more change in your brain. <laughs> What was, what was the answer? And at the time, the uh, very strong belief was that once you get to adulthood, no change, because there was no evidence of change. Well, she and her colleagues set out to answer this fundamental question, and she did it in a simple but elegant way. She um, subdivided a set of rats, there were identical rats, one set of rats went into the Disney world of rat cages. They were big, they had lots of toys, they had lots of rats to play with, and it was just the, the uh, dream rat cage of a rat life. <laughs> and um, the other rats went into what they called an impoverished environment, which was a much smaller cage, maybe one other rat, no toys. And both rats got free food and water as much as they could eat, and uh, they lived there for three idyllic months, at least for the ones in the Disney World of Rat Cages. And then, at the end of that, they said, these were adult rats. If there's no change, then there should be absolutely no difference between the uh, brains of the Disney World rats and the impoverished rats. And what she found is that those rats that were raised in Disney World, the outer covering of the brain, this is called the cortex, the cerebral cortex, they have it in rats as well, was thicker. It actually had grown and they could demonstrate that. And we now call that brain plasticity. <laughs> Depending on your environment, what kind of environment you're living in, you could live in the Disney world of rock cages, it is going to stimulate your brain to grow. And not all over the place, in the areas that seem to be more enriched. The visual cortex got a little bit thicker. The somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex got a little bit thicker. And for me, that was the most fascinating thing that I'd ever heard in my life. It was like the outbreak moment for, for you. And I said, I want to study brain plasticity. So I got myself a job right here down the street at NYU, and I studied one of the most common forms of brain plasticity called, uh, the, uh, called um, uh, memory. You, every time, how many of you have formed a new memory today? Do you remember something new? Very, very common. It turns out that every single time you form a memory, you change your brain a little bit. And those long-term memories are dependent on what structure? The hippocampus. Okay. So this was great. I was studying brain plasticity. But then something happened. I gained 25 pounds. It was pretty. I, I was trying very hard to get tenure at New York University, and I was doing nothing but work. I would just go from my house to my uh, uh, lab, and I would get a lot of takeout, and I didn't go to the gym, and, and I gained 25 pounds. And I said, oh, God, I, I've got to fix this. And um, all the time studying memory. And I went to the gym, and I started working out, and I started feeling really good. How many of you have noticed that when you go to the gym, your mood gets a little bit better? Yes, okay, I noticed that as well. But then, after about a year and a half of regularly going to the gym, I really changed my, my fitness level. I noticed something very striking. My memory, my long-term memory, depending on the hippocampus, got better. 
my focus got better. And I thought, wow, what's going on? Am I just having a good day? And it turns out that when I went back to the literature to figure out what we knew about the effects of exercise on the brain, I found a very familiar name. That name was Marion Diamond. You remember those enriched environments that the rats were living in? Well, it turns out that those rats were changing their brain because they were running around a lot more than the rats in the impoverished environment. In fact, you can get all of those, almost all of those brain changes uh, simply by giving rats a running wheel. They didn't need the whole Disney World, they just needed that running wheel. And we had come a long way in starting to understand that physical activity was one of the most powerful things to cause adult brain plasticity. It was changing your brain. I'm going to leave you. Now, when you come to my lab, I'll fill in all the details, but I'm going to leave you with the most important thing and the important way that physical activity changes your brain. It stimulates the birth of brand new brain cells in my favorite brain area, which is the hippocampus. And what does that do? What do you think brand new brain cells in the hippocampus does? What? What? Store memory. It improves your memory. Absolutely. And that's what I was noticing after I started going to the gym. So what it does is it actually stimulates the release of things called growth factors in your brain. That is the thing that makes uh, neurons connect with each other, with synapses, and in the hippocampus, not all over the brain, but in the hippocampus, it stimulates the birth of brand new brain cells. So, everybody, how many people are on sports teams? How many people do regular exercise, even not on sports teams? Great. That means that you are stimulating growth factors in your brain that's stimulating the birth of brand new brain cells. And that's why I call physical activity the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain because you are literally helping your brain grow new brain cells, particularly in the hippocampus. Okay, so what the other big thing that I want to leave you with is that um, when you exercise also makes a difference. So if you learn something new and then you work out, you tend to remember it better. This is great for your strategies, for studying for all those tests that you need to study. And did I happen to mention that I'm an exercise instructor? <laughs> okay, and I want you to remember everything that I told you. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up, and we are going to do three minutes of exercise. All you have to do is do what I do, say what I say. Here is your practice. It's punches right and left. Go right, left, right, left, right, left. And I say, I am strong now. You say it. I am strong now. Okay, practice is over. You can start. Here we go. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. I am 
our next speaker and all through the rest of the afternoon. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to hosting you in my lab in just a few minutes. Oh, and uh, do we have time for two questions? Two questions, yes. This is a human brain. Yes. Um, I call it Betty, but actually I don't know whether it came from a man or a woman. Any other questions that I can answer? Yes. Mm, that's a great question. So the question was, how does exercise affect the growth of brain tumors? So maybe those growth factors that I talked about could actually stimulate the growth of tumors. The thing is that the factors that stimulate tumor growth are different from this particular factor. Brain um, is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor that is specifically helping the hippocampus grow. So that is not a danger for um, for cancer growth. And in fact, exercise, regular exercise, is associated with decreases rates of getting cancer. So it's a good thing to add exercise to your regimen. And one more quick one. Yes? Why does it make your brain thicker? Why does it make your brain thicker? That's a great question. So it goes back, um, why does exercise make your brain thicker? And the answer is it goes back to those growth factors. The growth factors are not only increasing the number of cells that kind of make things every uh, a little fluffier, but they also stimulate the um, growth of synapses, the connections between individual neurons. So with <coughs> exercise, you have more synapses than without, and that ends up actually increasing the actual volume of the brain. Great question. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>